All the greatest people sleep well. All this Mark Wahlberg, 3 a.m., 4 a.m. stuff. No, what are you doing here? I don't like daily anything. I don't believe in daily anything. Daily discipline because people are boring. I think one of the challenges is that most strategies for success, including like spiritual strategies, faith strategies, are built around personality types. I learn really fast from other people's experiences. It can be both intellectual, I can learn really fast from other people, or it can be experiential. And I go, oh, they got the outcome I'm looking for. You were listening to Mind Shift Podcast with Aaron McManus and Earl McManus. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Now, normally, I, I, I let you sort of like introduce our concepts or thoughts for the day. Okay. But I, but I kind of have a question for you. And, and the reason I want to direct it towards you is you're, you're better at this than me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Talk to me. There are so many people in social media who are talking about your morning routines, you know, do a thousand pull-ups, a thousand sit-ups, you know, no one's three hours of that. planks. No, no it, it, that's what it sounds like. Okay. <laughs> and, okay. Uh, and, and then after three hours, then you're ready to go to work. Right. And what does your best morning routine look like I, I, when you're really in the flow, when you feel like you're at working at an optimal level? I would say that my best morning routine is definitely determined by how I, how I approach the night before. Ooh. Okay. Right. The, the approach, I think, is the, the 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 most important thing. The lead up to to the morning. Um, I'm. I mean, I think I, you're someone who maybe do you get do you get great sleep? I do not get great sleep. Right. So that's that's a challenge that I that I have tried to overcome. Right. Uh, I I didn't sleep very well maybe growing up, and I think through college, and I think maybe in early in my adult years, I would stay out late and stay up late, and and you know two or three in the morning would roll around, and then I'd have you know, and then during COVID it was like three or four, and then working 12, 15 hour days. Um, so one thing that I started doing was making sure I go to sleep early. So you start your morning routine the day before. The, the day before. before. One, completely cut out alcohol. All right. Just <laughs> completely cut out alcohol. Don't do it. The 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 night like I don't I'm not a big drinker in general, but the nights that I'll have a glass of wine or two, um, at versus the nights where I don't drink anything. Like that is ninety nine percent of the, the month I don't drink anything, right? Um and and I think that's a game changer for me. Yeah. The light turns on. The thing my my parents told me not to do growing up, uh now is is the thing I I I, I preach about. But um no, it's it's a it's a game changer. Don't drink, uh get great sleep. And so my nighttime routine starts with this is now I, I, I have, I have access to a sauna. So I sauna, I red light sauna, I sweat it out every I, night or every morning, not every night. Okay. I do it. At, I do it in the evening. So okay. if I can, I do it, you know, between like six to 9 PM, do it for 20 to 45 minutes, depending on how long I can take it. Um, I didn't know how to work it for the first <laughs> month. So I was, I was like, oh, this, you know, it's not very hot. And now I'm, I'm dying in it. <laughs> Um, I'm but, glad it's working now. Yeah, it's glad it's working now. Uh, well, I'm working now. <laughs> uh, but sauna, and I know that sounds like everyone's on it. Everyone's on it. Do the sauna, do the sauna, do the sauna. But it, it's a game changer. Doing the sauna, and then and then I, you know, obviously I, I take a shower, and then usually in the sauna I'm drinking as much water as I can. I drink a liter of water in the sauna to just flesh that out. I, I hate drinking water. I know. I've been doing these <laughs> electrolyte things. I'm late to the game, but I've been. You've been on the electrolyte packets. Yes, because I, I hate water so much. That I love the electrolytes. But, it, it makes it easier for me a buddy was staying with me he left some so i just used them and i've been loving it and so i t i drink the water i uh, you know i shower off I, I i i get into bed i try to keep my phone as far away from my bed as i can so i try to like leave it in in the bathroom but you don't put it on silence or i turn do it off for the night? i'm dnd &D from the moment i walk into my door dnd &D. so it's do not disturb oh, okay okay yeah okay. i wish i could live my life on dnd &D. <laughs> don't talk to me <laughs> Um, but you know, that's that, you know, so, so I sauna, I, I get into bed early. I, I, I try not to watch TV. I try not to be on my phone. Sometimes that's impossible. And then and I just get into bed. I go to sleep. Right. And but I what time? I, it really depends. You what's, know, what's the range? It, I, I'm usually in bed by 10, 10 30. So 10 okay. p.m., 10 30. And that's, right. that's late for some people. That's early for some people. But at least for there, I can get, I can wake up at 5 30 or 6 and I feel great. Well, you know, I think the, the, the research we'd seen on mental restoration is that the most important hours to sleep are between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. 2 a.m. Yes. So those four hours are the only time where your brain is actually getting 
restorative sleep. Right. And I, I wear all the things. I wear the aura. I wear the whoop. I, I, I've been trying everything out. And in honestly, like I, the longer I wear it, the less I care about it. But it, the, the more it keeps me aware of my rhythm, right? Like, okay, staying, making sure I'm going to sleep before a certain time. My body, I've trained my body so much to where if I'm out past like 12, like I'm awake past 12, my body's just, just like, freaking out like get, get like, shut down <laughs> shut down this is your this is not operable uh you know it's not safe operating uh uh protocol that's why you remind me of Kelly and murphy the other day when they were asking me he goes i love sleep he goes i love my sleep but he, <laughs> he did talk about that because they were talking to him about how he's a terrible castmate when they're shooting because he's so focused he, and when they're going to dinner he doesn't talk he doesn't he's talk like, <laughs> he doesn't want to really hang out he just wants to like be focused he said i need my sleep <laughs> yeah, but I do find I'm more successful the next day when I'm prepared the night before, right? And maybe, you know, and, I, and, and I'm and i in my, I'm 35, I'm turn 36 this year. And so right now it's like, how do, how do I want to squeeze the most out of life. I want to make sure that I'm like living as fulfilled as I can the next day. And when I wake up exhausted and, and tired and under, you know, I hate when I'm underperforming. I hate when I'm not physically active. I love to train. So I love to be up early. I love to go on runs. I do three to five miles in the morning, a few times a week, mostly three, but sometimes five you run run yeah on run. purpose outside you like yeah. physically running not like yeah, running you know yeah running meditating no. like no you know visualizing no, myself running you, for no three miles. no no <laughs> but you uh, a, a great alternative is get on the treadmill i do that hot girl walk thing the 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 three speed at 12 incline for 30 minutes uh, and we've actually just turned it up we we do we do the three speed 12 incline and then what we'll do is every other minute we'll we'll run at like uh, an eight speed. So you know, f five minutes in, you're throw you're wanting to throw up pretty badly. But it kind of it kind of it kind of sheds the weight off. So I'm trying to build muscle or trying to gain weight. I have to be really diligent because my body's naturally skinny. And and people can say, oh, it's such a great advantage to be naturally skinny. For a skinny guy who wants to not be skinny it's it's hard i'm having a hard time finding empathy but go ahead <laughs> no i i yeah i get it but it's 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 a different it's a different battle right yeah. so because i'll wither away if i if i don't be disciplined about my eating and my sleeping and my my rest but all the great athletes all the great all, all the greatest people sleep well all this stuff about you got to be up at three o'clock all this mark Wahlberg, 3 a.m 4 a.m stuff no what are you doing here like i listen to ed Milet talk and like love ed but like Actually, I don't know Ed, so I don't love him, but you know, I like him. But he's like, he's like, I live, what is he? He says, I live five days in one day. He's like, I wake up at like four and from four to seven is my one day. And then seven to 10 is my next day. And then 10 to one. And he says something like that, like in four hour increments. It's smart. It's smart to break up your day like that. But honestly, I'm going 6.30, I'm good. You know, I get up and I listen to Bezos talk about something. Um, he talked about how important it is to wake up and wander. And he, he self describes he describes himself as an inventor. And he talks about the process of being an inventor. And he's like, look, my role is very different at Amazon now. But but now I'm inventing with Blue Origin, his his space company. Mm -hmm. And he's like, it's so important for me to kind of wake up and not subscribe to these like waking up, sawning, cold plunging, journaling, this like three hour routine that I think people get lost in. So I think find out what works for you. And you know, my my therapist who, you know, bless her heart for dealing with my crazy mind. But um, she, I was having a really hard time traveling with you and being like, I don't have routines. I don't have routines with friends. I don't have routines in my life. I'm not dating anyone. I don't have enough time for it. Um, and she's like, look, man, you're, I've known you and you, you're like, I, she's like, I coach a lot of people. You're, you guys are some of the busiest people I coach as far as traveling. And I'm like, he's like, she's like, you're kind of like pro athlete vibe. And I'm, and I'm like, yeah, we travel <laughs> every week for the most part. Yeah. And um, I'm getting on a plane in a couple hours. Literally, literally yeah. getting on a plane. And I mean, I think the first- And month, we'll come back tomorrow. First month of January, we traveled every week. And yeah. then we were supposed to do the same in Feb and my house flooded. So thank God I stayed for a weekend. <laughs> um, so we work five days a week and then we go and travel for two days and we're back for Sunday. So it's like, we, we don't stop. You know, so so she really made a big precedent of like, okay, you're a person of faith, so stop having routine and start having rituals. What's your morning ritual? Like, give yourself five minutes that you can take anywhere on the road, anywhere in the world, and have five minutes to fifteen minutes of just your space. She talked about you know being grateful, talked about praying, talked about meditating, talked about being silent, talked about listening to my even my body, what's my mind saying, what kind of what kind of state am I in, and then kind of recalibrate. 
you know, she's like, be grateful. Remember the things you're, you're building. Remember the people you're looking out for. Remember the things that, you know, you got to focus on and then plan the day out. And she's like, just get day to day to get back to your home and then start getting back into the routine. Um, and I don't know if that works, but I'm working on it now. What about you? What are your things? But I've also seen you, I've seen you even sometimes when you didn't know at restaurants and you've had your Bible and you're in the morning and you're reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for you, sure. You're a person who seems to meditate and actually like reflect very as a, a part of who you are yes i think that's really i mean it's the first it's the second verse of the of the first chapter of psalm it says i meditate on your word day and night right that's what that's what it says right yeah yeah i'm gonna pull that up because maybe i quoted a different part but that's what it says is it psalm one psalms it's well psalms one two yeah i was talking about this with a, with a friend actually on facetime and they were saying that their grandma always gives them a hard time whenever they talk about meditating and i said well you should tell your grandma as in verse two it says but whose delight is in the law of the lord and who meditates on his law day and night that person is like a tree planted by streams of water and i was able to quote it because i was more confident in the moment now i'm getting nervous um but i do think you know you're big on on no, don't just pray don't just ask listen and i think meditating is an act of listening yeah. Being in a state of like listening to what God or whatever you believe in, and I believe in God, we're people of faith, and and what is he trying to say to you, you know? And so I think it's 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 the act of stillness. And today, not so still. Angry day. <laughs> Came to the office, everything's under construction, everyone's prepping for conference, and I wasn't, I'm not happy because I like my quiet in the mornings. You know, the chaos, it gets to you. Chaos gets to me, yeah. Maybe it's... Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, you're probably one of the most sensatory people I know. Like, if, like slightly autistic. If the sounds are off, it, it'll drive you insane. If the smells, you can smell. You can smell things other oh, people can't smell. Brother, <laughs> this morning, it was a triple threat. <laughs> Dead. I'm not kidding. I walk in and I go, what's that smell? At least it's like, it's the rubber band wristbands from Mosaic Conference I left in my office and it made the whole room smell like, honestly, I called it plastic diarrhea. <laughs> 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 but you, you understand that out of a thousand people, only one person is overwhelmed by that smell. It's, it's me. Like, yeah, it's, it's me. <laughs> it's me. That's and, crazy. And maybe 10 other people will notice the smell, but they will just keep on going. Uh, I hate people who are sent. It's crazy. People who are sent, I'm like, why? Why would you, do, why'd you mess up what God gave you? <laughs> shower. Just shower. <laughs> well, you wouldn't do well in France. No, because they don't shower. Um, but they use a lot. That's where Cologne comes they, from, yeah, you, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in yeah. Italy, I guess. And does it come from Cologne, Germany? Austin, where does Cologne come from? <laughs> Let's Google come. It. We want to know. We want to know. Google it. The My Ship Podcast wants to know uh, where anyway. Cologne originated. So, and, but I do think this idea of rituals is unique. Yeah. Because rituals you can take anywhere. So whether it's praying, reading your Bible, like you don't read your Bible in the mornings. You, you read your Bible, you, when you do, you, well, now you kind of have a lot of it memorized, yeah. which is actually not an understatement. It's wild. Um, the, um, but you, you used to do it late at night yeah. or the middle of the day. Yeah. It, it's, it's a, and I would say it, it's very organic for me now. Well, I say now, but you know, for 30 years, 40 years, because even the talks I do on Sundays at Mosaic, I write those talks pretty much completely from the Bible in my mind. And um, I search for the passages in my mind. Um, I break them down in my head. And, and then after I have formed this idea, this concept, then I go to um, like a physical text or something in um, the Bible app, which, you know, our friends and um, at Life Church have created and, um, you know, Craig and Bobby, and uh, I'll use that like crazy, okay. right? And really grateful for that. But yeah, most of the Bible I access, definitely the first 90% of it is from the Bible that I've memorized that I have inside of me. And, and that's probably been true for decades for me. And, and the advantage it gives me is that I can be walking to get a cup of coffee and I'm interacting with principles and with the scriptures and listening to what, you know, what God may be saying to me. And yeah, so it's, it's, it's less scheduled for me and more organic for me than, um, than it used to be, and it was always very organic for me. You know, I, I mean, I used to work really hard at establishing like structural disciplines, which were not very natural for my uh, personality and the way I'm structured. And so, yeah, I would, you know, 
read the Bible every morning and pray every morning and and try to get all those things done. And and then I'd mess up three days later, and then I'd feel really bad about myself, and then I'd start all over again. <laughs> yeah, but I, yeah, and journal and yes. you know, and journal every day. And I don't like daily anything. I don't believe in daily anything. No, I, like daily discipline. I, those people, those people are boring. Like I love, like I love you. I love you. You're out there. You're listening. I love you. I don't don't hear me wrong. I love you. I don't want nothing to do with you though. Uh, <laughs> I, I need you in my life, but I don't. I, you know, it, like because I eating and drinking water is like my the thing. The only thing I do every day and sleep. You know, everything else I figure out. Like my workout schedule is different. My my life is different. Office hours are different. Like I for me, that's the constant letdown of my life. If I did a daily discipline, I would be failing every third day. So I have to forgive myself. So I just go, okay, you know, it's consistency. Am I going to win the year, not the, not, not the week? Yeah. I think one of the challenges is that most strategies for success, including like spiritual strategies, faith strategies, are built around personality types. And they're usually dominated by people who would fall into um, the sensing, judging, I think what Kiersey would call the guardian. Um, they're highly structured, um, highly regimented, um, and so they would have the basic disciplines. They Their whole life is organized. It's not just that their faith is organized. Their whole life is organized. And I have so and much respect for these guys. They and do. we need them. We need more of them. A absolutely. If you're out there, come to LA. And, and, and there's certainly um, like structures and practices that you can take on even when you're not naturally structured like that. But the problem is that all of discipleship, all of like life disciplines were kind of like owned by people in that world. And then the second, you know, world is like this uh, sensing, perceiving kind of activist, kind of um, athletic um, personality that, you know, they're, they're the ones that, um, they're usually the ones that have washboard stomachs. They're, they're usually the ones that um, are pushing themselves physically and, and their, their whole psychology of discipline is, is built around their physicality. And, uh, and then that's like a big model right now. You know, and you have to become like them. But what do you do if you're not structured like those two dominant personality styles? If you're um, more of an intuitive feeler, more of an idealist kind of person, or more like a rational, intuitive thinker? And and uh, I was joking. Uh, I, I guess during a, a staff retreat, we actually had a contest, and my team won. I forgot about that. And so it was the my game, team, but it's cool. Oh, uh, I was on your team. Yeah, I invited you. You invited me. It's true. I right, put you on no team. Yeah, yeah. That's that other child. Yeah, because child. She, she didn't want to skew a team. <laughs> I have. said, in my high advantage, said, <laughs> I want the smartest person in the room on my team. <laughs> and so today they gave us a, a mug, or what is it called? A, it's a Stanley Cup. A Stanley Cup, and it says now on it, it says, the mind. It says the mind. Which is the event that we won, or the, the contest we won. And I said, though, that's my new superhero name, uh, the, the mind. mind. <laughs> and, uh, but... Um, but there are people who are designed more like the mind. They're more rational. Um, you know, they uh, they just have a different way of approaching the world. And I think the problem sometimes is that all the models we get for how to live an optimal life is built around the dominant personality styles or dominant psychological structures. And then it doesn't work for other people. You have to realize that one... Um, I actually work from a conviction that God has made every person unique. And, and so God's not trying to establish a relationship with someone he designed one way with the same approach for someone he designed differently. Mm -hmm. And so I, I am absolutely convinced that God has a way of relating to me that fits the way he designed me in a way to relate to you that fits the way he designed you. And, um, and so I, I commend everyone who has the way that works for them. But I think early in my faith, I felt I was like, a, a, you know, whatever, like a salamander tried to be like a turtle. You know, they were giving me this shell. It did not fit my body. And they were trying to say, no, this is what it means to have faith. This is what it means to be spiritual. This is what it means to be a disciple. And I'm like, wow, I'm never going to make it. <laughs> you know, I'm never going to make it. But the moment faith became something different, being highly intuitive, paying attention to invisible signs, and, you know, um, moving fast, moving fearlessly, all of a sudden it was to my advantage. And now faith, it looked very natural to me. And I think that's a part of it is that there, I think there's a rhythm in life. 
that fits you. And there's a rhythm in life that fits me. And there's a rhythm in life that fits each individual. And it's okay to imitate other people's rhythms of lives because it's in the imitation you discover what fits you well. And then sometimes you realize, oh, 25% of what this person is doing fits me perfectly. The other part of it, I just need to discard. I need to pick up another 25% from someone else. Yeah, I don't think there's ever, you know, I, I, I follow all these fitness guys and, 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 you know, and I think it's really interesting when they create plans for people. I, I love to read them. I'm so interested. I like, and I pick little things here and there. I'm like, okay, this works. This doesn't work. My schedule is unpredictable. So I can't predict what kind of workout or what kind of thing or what I'm going to eat, but you know, I can do this and do this. And I wish I could have a more regulated lifestyle. Like I, I do prefer function and I do prefer consistency. It just the reality is that I was born your son. And so there this just doesn't exist. And you just <laughs> like there are days where it, it, it could day can compl get completely turned upside down. You know, and any plan that I've had, it just completely changes. And it affects everything, man. It affects friendships, it affects relationships, it, it affects you know, just daily things. And but I but it's the life I signed up for. So you know I'm just embracing th that it's I chose this. It's not even the life you signed up for. It's the life that you got signed up for. Yeah, but no, no, no. <laughs> You're born into it. I could have left. <laughs> no. I'm capable. I could have done other things. Yeah, no, I'm saying when you were a baby, when you were a child. I'm not a child. When you were born into it. S someone said this to me the other day. They said, oh, you're a pastor's son. I said, I've been a man for the last 17 years. Yeah. So, you know. Yes. Come at me again. Uh, I've been I've been a man for a minute. So you and call me <laughs> pastor's son again. Project, project <laughs> your uh, judgment on me. But no, I think I think... Yeah, the reality is that we did, I signed up for it. This is, this is the life, I love right? It. Um, what else is there? What else we got? Well, I just think this is a, a good conversation because like I, I, I learn both from experience, but also I really do learn from other people. Like I, I can, and I think one of the things that I, it, I have as an advantage is I learn really fast from other people's experiences. And I don't need to go, quote, go through it myself, <laughs> you know? And so it can, it can be both intellectual. I can learn really fast from other people or it can be experiential. And I go, oh, they got the outcome I'm looking for. And, and that's why I think it's really important to be aware of the uniqueness of what works best for you. It's kind of ironic because this past week I was doing blood work and everything like that. And, and, um, and I said, hey, I really want to get rid of this visceral fat, you know, and even though it's it's harder now than ever before. And because right now, I'm, I mean, I have, I'm fasting off of breads. I mean, I haven't had bread in, you know, four or five days, which for me is nothing short of a miracle. Eating tons of protein. I'm doing, you know, all the stuff. Eating fiber, eating chia seeds, like, you know, uh, my life depends on it. I'm, I'm trying to do all the right stuff. And they said, well, really the two main factors for you is going to be sleep and stress. And I said, what? <laughs> I said, yeah, if you really want to lose the visceral fat fast, you need to sleep enough and you need to have almost no stress in your life. And I'm like, well, I have no hope then. <laughs> no, but I do, no, I do think you do. I, I do, I, I no, no, I, I think, no, I don't accept that because I, I think anything you, yeah, because the same way I don't, I don't accept. I, I think anyone who you, you can overcome almost anything. Of course, I'm right? being but, sarcastic. No, no, I know, but yeah. it, but there are things, right? Like there, are, you, you know, you, you, you uh, I want to be sensitive here. <laughs> um, there are things you don't like to do, and and you don't and really like sleeping. Like I like sleep. <laughs> I blacked out my room so I could sleep. You know, and and I I, I try to protect that sleep. Yeah, and. I'm, and I can, I can exist. I can do it without it. But we, you know, in Denver, that Denver trip, man, like I, it took something from me yeah. that, that 4 a.m. <laughs> to like 7 a.m. wake up call, a few hours yeah. of sleep. And I didn't make me upset. I, I, it wasn't, it didn't regulate my mood, but I was like, oh no, physically, like I, I worked out every day that week, two a days, like sauna three times a week. Like my body needed that sleep. And you know, I, I train based on how I optimize my body. So if I don't sleep, then I messes up my training. You know what I mean? And like yeah. it messes up the work, but you know, so there's a bit of it is like, how do you just roll with it and be resilient? But there's the other side is like, just be consistent and do whatever it takes to get to sleep. Yeah. Ironically, it's probably the, one of the biggest disciplines that I've been focusing on is yeah. sleeping. Yeah. And, and I realized that before I could actually sleep, I had to change my mind about sleep being a weakness. And I think that I've lived my entire life just sort of like an internal narrative 
that sleep is a sign of weakness. And it's, it is tricky, you know, because you realize, oh, wow, I, I have to war against my view of reality. And you realize, no, you know, sleep is a, is a gift. In fact, by the way, the Bible says God gives sleep to those he loves. And I mean, why is that in the middle of the Bible? How odd that that verse is there. And, you know, so even if I wanted to look it's at it from God like. God doesn't love you or he <laughs> loves me more. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. That's not really the way I was trying to interpret that, that we verse. Know that ain't true. So there's some, <laughs> no. there must be a there must have been an asterisk. No, but maybe it's like Somewhere you, you have to love yourself enough to sleep. You, you know, care enough about your body, care enough about your health. Or just and realizing that it's important, right? Yeah. And that's been a newer thing, you know. Yeah, I didn't grow up being told to sleep was important. You, you know, and and you know, I think again, you know, people are designed differently. And I actually do like the new science that says that everyone doesn't need eight hours. That based on the way you're designed you actually function well based on a different amount of sleep. Yeah, no, you, like you know. there, are, there, are, there are nights where I've slept eight. I can't really sleep. I mean, if I sleep to eight, it's a freaking miracle. It's usually six, you know, and six, but, but like at the right time, right? Like, yeah, it's usually six, seven. Yeah, but I, I don't know. I think really it's about f what works for you, what, yeah. you know, and then, but anything under six isn't good for you, really. It's right. not, you're not, I mean, unless you're doing nothing, right? And there's really having a low functioning day. But for the most part, like you really do, should be exhausting your body and, and making sure you're squeezing everything out. Um, but really, beyond that, though, like, do you have rituals that that serve you well? I'm I'm making adjustments now for the first time in my life. Strangely enough, at this time in my life, where I'm trying to go to bed earlier, and which I never did for you know the first six decades, yeah. and um, and I actually find that to be incredibly beneficial for me. You know, when I say earlier, like. By midnight, yeah, yeah, you, you know, and so if I'm if I'm in bed and falling asleep by midnight, I'm considering that a massive win, like for me, yeah, and um, and then usually if I sleep six hours, I feel pretty good, like it, it, you know, and and if I get seven hours, I feel like I've just like stolen you something. The world. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's interesting. And what, one of the things that's really helped me is this idea of like a readiness score. Is that from the aura ring? Yeah, from the aura that this is not a commercial, but. No, I got one right here. I've been wearing it. it the old one. It's helped me because I realized, oh, the reason my sleep is so important is that I can have a higher ability to engage this day at a, with more energy, more clarity, more focus. And. And so I, I, you know, I guess there's a part of me that likes being competitive against my own body. Yeah. It's like, okay, I just, I want to really be ready for this day. And we you know without any technology, you, you can feel it. You can feel when you wake up and you're ready for the day. Absolutely. And you can feel when you're dragging out of bed. And, and I do think people are designed differently. I mean, some people just jump out of bed. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I, not, one of those I'm not a jumper out of bed. No, I'm a, I'm a. I'm a roller. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know. As people say, you know, just jump out of bed and get going. I'm like, that's awesome. I I love that. That's that works for you. And and what what I usually do is I wake up and I don't even say I'm awake because yeah. I don't want to talk. Like, because you know I'm married, and so your mom comes right there or she's running around, and in the moment she sees I'm awake, she wants to talk. And oh, no, that's I true. need like an talk, no talking in the morning. I need an hour, yeah, where I'm just in my head, yeah, and that is my like readiness. I mean, I on Saturdays I spend most of my weekend like you know Sundays obviously we, I, I go to church when I'm in town, um, but I don't I don't speak a lot on Saturdays, and that's my that's one of my favorite days because <laughs> I I like to wake up I like I like I mean I'll put on I, I've been really big into music without words I was listening to a podcaster and I think he was he was a Muslim guy and he talked about how music with words is haram like how it's like almost like sin and bad and in his culture and he was modern he's like I still listen to the words with music or like uh, sorry music with words but I was I, I thought about it I was like oh no like you you do really intake so much of what is being said in the song. So whether it's whether it's worship, whether it's whether it's um, and sometimes worship words like music, like lyrics and worship sometimes are so whack. Like, I, like please tell me. Oh, I would love to ask you this about someone's um, 
prophetic word over my life via DMs, but I, I don't even, that's not what this podcast is about. Um, oh, no, I think inquiring no. minds want to know. <laughs> no, I know, no, 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 because I don't want to, because like the guy that sent it, my thing is this, is like, I'm a, I'm a, I really love, is it Tom Holland who was quoting, was it Mel Gibson or someone who said, if you don't have my number, you don't know me well enough to have an opinion about me? I think it was, um, who's Batman? It's Christian Bale. Christian Bale. I think it was, was Christian, Christian Bale. Bale. Yeah, yeah. He talked about basically, but then I think Holland was like, yeah, re yeah he, know, he recorded him. It. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I, my thing is this is like, if someone, ha and prophetic words for those of you who, you know, maybe are outside the church space and, and, and it, it, you know, if you've ever seen Hogwarts, um, there's a set of, 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 of verses in the Bible that get real, you know, interesting. Um, Acts would be one of the more interesting books. And there's some stuff that happens. And some people have read that stuff and now they think they're wizards on behalf of Jesus. Um, and they're weird. And and some of them are, are some of them are real. But that's the problem is that you get it's like it's like standing in a in a storm of hail where ninety percent of it is just gonna hurt you. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the, but there is something sometimes there's something real in it. You just have to wade through it all. Yeah, and 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 so someone you know reached out. Hey, you know, I know you couldn't make it to our dinner, and I, you know, it was really kind of them to invite me the same day, um, and I just couldn't make it. Um, and you know, but one of our one of our people from back home has a word for you. And this did, person didn't know you. Did I don't think they. Know. I mean, okay. imagine they know the podcast or know. Yeah. Or may, I think we did a podcast at their at their their church in 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 England. And and. Uh, and it was, didn't ask me, do you, would you, can I share with you? Just shared it with me. Long DM. And I woke up to it. I woke up and just rolled my eyes. One, I just realized, don't, I, I'm, 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 the next thing I'm, it, I'm in, in, embracing into my, my routine is no phone for the first 30 minutes. I'm going to really start that after conference, after this week. Just because one, it's like, who, it is a crazy idea that we give strangers access to the insides of our home, insides of our brains. Yeah. Right. Before we even talk to people that actually know us, you know. So I'm like, I no more DMs before I before I'm out into the world, and and but it was just some it was just some weird nonsensical prophecy that was like, it was the first part was positive, and then he never established which part was negative, but I'm guessing it's the second part. But it's something about masks and and air and 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 me needing to more oxygen and and I you know I. It is fine. I don't. It doesn't bother me. But the only thing that bothers me is don't give someone who doesn't know me access to me. Yeah. Right. Because what I what it shared me there in that moment is that oh that person's not a safe person and that person is not a discerning person. Yeah. Because I'm not gonna give him someone that someone else, like I would never give someone's number to someone without asking their permission. You know. So that it was one of those unique things. But I'm curious to because I would say that there are people who are prophetic and people who can see into the future a little bit and and people who are um very hogwarts like so uh, you know talk to me gandalf all right that's not the same movie dumbledore i'm going to start from the other end this is from my perspective how you can know a person is legitimate okay they don't tell you that they're prophesying over you what do they tell you they just wait for the opportunity if invited to speak into your life in a gracious way and they let the truth of it get to you or not get to you. Okay. And when a person goes, I have a prophecy for you, you can just check and go, no. Why? Why? It's the odd dynamic of self-identification. It's the prophecy isn't what's important to them. It's that you see them as a prophet. Interesting. I have a prophecy for you. It's like, so it's really about them. It's actually narcissistic. God has spoken to me about you without talking to you. You see, that's how important I am. That's how close to God I am. That God can't even go to you directly. He has to go to me. And so they become like an old, you know, a modern version of a saint. <laughs> you know, you have to go to the saint to get to God. And one of the rules, since we're talking about this, that I have is God will never say something to someone else about you that he hasn't already told you. How do you know that? Because you have a direct relationship with Jesus, with God. It says that it is Jesus who's always interceding for you. So God speaks directly to you. But in the Bible, there was tons of people who, you know, kings that were spoken That's to That's right, because the prophets. kings were not listening. So there's times I don't listen. Or they didn't I'm have not God. A king, but there's times I don't listen. And, and sometimes the kings didn't actually know God. Okay, and, so here's my thing. I don't listen sometimes. Yeah. Uh, right now, I wouldn't say I'm listening a whole lot. <laughs> you know, I, 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 op I keep it open and, I, and then I close it real quick. All right. 
And so know? if someone actually came and they sent something to you, you would know, oh, this is something God's saying to me. And I've been ignoring it. It'll resonate. And I'll tell you that, first of all, I think most, I'm just gonna say, most, quote, prophecy in the Christian world is the result of psychological unhealth and emotional unhealth, that people are essentially neurotic and unhealthy and they use spiritual language. And what you end up doing is you let unhealth dictate culture rather than health. Uh, so you, you probably know this, but I, I came to faith, then I go to seminary because I was gonna, you know, in my mind, I was gonna go to Yale and go to law school because that's not like a cool thing to do. But I become a follower of Jesus and they tell me to go to seminary. Right. I don't know what a seminary is, so I go to seminary. So I'm in line registering for class and they have older um, students who help you, the new students. Okay. So this girl picks me and helps me in line. And, you know, I'm brand new at faith and now I'm getting my master's degree at a seminary. Oh, I know, I know the story. And within probably a month, this girl tells me that God told her that I have to marry her. So this is my first experience Has with like, to. yeah, this is like my, prof Brave this is my prophetic brother, this tragedy, <laughs> right? You know, so this girl who I look up to because she's been there two years and she's more spiritual than me and I'm a brand new Christian. She tells me that God told her I, um, that I was to marry her. And, and I remember my first response was, you know, God hasn't said anything to me, you, you know. Great response, great return. <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, uh, but we were still friends because, you know, yeah. I, I didn't discount her as a person. And then another few weeks go by and she came back and said, uh, God told me you're, you have, you're supposed to marry me. And if you wouldn't stop being so rebellious that you would hear his voice. And, and I remember saying, I know this sounds like superficial, but I want to fall in love. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like you know, like yeah. you know, and yeah, um, and eventually, of course, when I started dating your mom, this person was telling people that I was living outside of God's will, Crazy. that you know I was disobeying God's voice. It was very bizarre. Yeah, and I had to grapple with that, and was so strange to add weirdness to weirdness. We're all going to this one church. There's this quote, revival meeting where they're having a speaker every night and it's like, you know, trying to connect more deeply to God. And I get invited to come to an, an L, a board meeting, elders meeting with the senior pastor. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm being invited in, you know, during this revival, they call me in and tell me that the reason the church isn't experiencing revival you haven't married that woman. is because I'm disobeying God by not listening to what God is saying to her prophetically. Now I'm young. Was was she related to him? No, she just went to him first. Oh, wow, man. <laughs> you wow. know, and uh, and looked super spiritual. She was like the super hyper spiritual person. Yeah, you, you know. Yeah, watch out for those ones. I had enough. I'm so grateful that I had enough like self efficacy in that morning, my moment to say. I looked around and said, "So what you're saying to me is that I I don't even have a position at this church." I'm not even in leadership at this church, but somehow I'm stopping God from doing something in this church. And, but it has nothing to do with any of you. Wild. And um, you're in Texas, right? Yeah. And then I got on a payphone because there were only payphones later. I went back to my dorm and I got on the phone. I don't remember who I called and I cried uncontrollably because I was just like so shaken up. My experience with, quote, prophetic people is dominantly unhealthy. Brand new Christian, I go into this Pentecostal Bible study where everyone's prophesying over everyone. They're all getting dreams and interpreting dreams. And, and I'm watching this go around. I'm going, I'm like in a circus, but I don't know enough about God or about the Bible to know whether it's right or wrong. So I'm sticking it out. I'm staying. Yeah. And it is entertaining. And and the guy in charge, he would always have he was always the dreamer and then interpreting the dreams. And so I thought, I'm gonna try some. So I knew it was gonna happen. So the next session, he has a dream. And then I jump in and I go, I got the interpretation. No, you didn't. I did. That's messed up. That's messed up. Even for you, that's messed up. This, is, this podcast is not making us look like good people. I got some friends that watch this podcast. So, so, <laughs> like, what kind of world so are you from? I brought this. Brilliant interpretation based on my Freudian psychology background at the time. And he didn't know what to do because he always used the dreams as a way of manipulating everyone. 
because he always came back with the interpretation of what they needed to do. Interesting. And and my interpretation was just very cool. And uh, okay, keep going. So you then, hijacked the process. Yeah, and then he goes, "Well, um, I, I have a secondary interpretation." Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I remember, and I, I'm just going to say it the way I experienced it. Afterwards, I've never said this on a podcast or out loud, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it since we're there. At the end of the session, the guy in charge goes, "Hey, for all of you who've never spoken in tongues, stay afterwards, or we're going to teach you." Uh, we're gonna. We're, I don't know if this is gonna make the podcast. We, we, we can edit this out. I've been a Christian maybe sixty days. I have no knowledge, but I heard this voice in my soul tell me this is wrong. Mm-hmm. That whatever the Holy Spirit gives you, someone doesn't have to teach you when it's a gift. And I, being of my nature, what would that nature be? <laughs> defiant rebellious the way that woman described you <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a warrior <laughs> a warrior i start beelining right to him in front oh, of everyone to oh, tell him no. what he's doing is deceptive and wrong <sighs> and i heard this little voice in my head say you don't know why he's wrong you just know that he's wrong did you get out of the room and i walked out of the room so you didn't tell him i didn't oh, man. because i is like I was going to war without any weapons because I didn't. I just knew in my spirit something was off. Yeah, it's and, it's it's very cultish behavior, but it's yeah. tough because it's like you know, obviously there's some great people who 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 speak in tongues. Of I course, it, it's not about the people. It was about this particular situation. Yeah, but yeah. I've also you know it. Uh, my thing is faith is a journey. Yeah, and so it's it's um. You know, you gotta. There's, there's good and bad. Humanity is a journey. Life is a journey. Uh, you know, people, people who criticize churches. I'm always, I'm always the first one to go. You think mosaics perfect? You think we're perfect? No. You think any? No, we don't. I think the difference is we've never pretended to be. Yeah. And that's what that's what I think it keeps us real. Because it's like no, it's like this place is this place has had so, like everyone has had issues with faith crises their own personal lives we just go this the logo used to be a broken art piece like the whole yeah. point was that a mosaic was built to broken pieces that we're going we're, we're, we're doing the best we can and i think we're a place where people can do the best they can here's the here's to me the guideline if you trust the character of the person you can trust their gifts and if you don't know the character of the person you need to be cautious Character becomes the measure of trustworthiness, not, quote, gifting. And, and you know, we had a conversation out in the lobby because your mom had this person on her team was just prophesying over everyone, but it was always negative. And, um, and then her and your mom were standing there and she you know, said to me, Pastor Erwin, you know, I, I need your help. I, I, God just keeps speaking to me all these prophecies and I speak them into people's lives and then they get offended and hurt and then they don't want to talk to me anymore. And I looked at her and I said, do you want to die alone? And Kim got really nervous and I said, she goes, no. And I said, you're going to die alone if you keep confusing your opinions with the gift of prophecy. And I care too much about you to pretend that what you're doing is healthy. So I want you to stop pretending you're prophesying. I want you to care about people, listen to them, support them and encourage them and it will change your relationships and kim was like soul is that woman still around yeah she actually came to me months later saying thank you you've changed my life she was i finally have friends in my life see i I think sometimes what happens is sincere people take on spiritual experiences but they don't realize that they've actually fused with their emotional psychological and sometimes mental unhealth and then they spiritualize the unhealth and what you have to do is you have to separate and go, no, this is an unhealthy part of who you are. And now you've spiritualized it. And we have to, and we, we want to help you get healthy. And so you have to detox that. But here's the thing is I'm as, I'm as hard on us as I am on, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't know. I don't like star boys, star girls. I don't like astrology. I don't, I don't really like <laughs> palm readers. I don't like, like the, I don't like the witches. No, 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 no. Um, I like none of it. 
I like, and it's not that I just li- I like mystical. I, I can there's there's something different about. Pe- I do believe people can see into things, and I do believe that there are people who are just tapped into some different, like whether it's empath or some kind of different like frequency, some spiritual frequency that can see diff- different things in, in the universe and in humanity. Now I do think it's God given. I think people yeah. have unidentified God given talents and gifts, right, and power. And I think good people have taken great advantage and done great things, and I think bad people have taken advantage and done great things. And I think that's the reality, right? You talked about it in your message yesterday. God doesn't distinct, d- d- distinguish between who he blesses, right? Like he blesses all humanity. Um, is that kind of what you said, right? Yeah, that, you know, God does good. And he rains on the, it says it rains on the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous. And yeah, so, so, yeah. Yeah. And so I think, you know, and just because we give credit to a specific being, you know, um, it doesn't it doesn't mean it doesn't exist in people who who don't believe in the same thing um and that's kind of the beauty of of humanity but but i will say the older i get and maybe i am a little bit jaded by it or um exhausted by it it's just i have zero i have little room for it i feel it's immature and that's more of that and i i find the the irony of like um spiritual elitists who go you know mosaic isn't deep enough for me i'm like man if it's not deep enough for you it's because you're you need you need to paint with color, pencils. And we're here having a much deeper, multi-layered conversation. Um, and you need it spelled out for you. And that's okay. I'm cool with it. I, I like the kid's Bible too. You know, I do. I, I do. I like the kid's Bible. It helps you learn stories. It helps you see things viscerally. Um, but don't judge just because we don't throw in the the Christianese, the isms, the, the the hallelujahs in the way that makes you feel comfortable, right? And that's the reality is that there's people who go to Disneyland to feel like they're on an adventure and there's people who go into the wild to feel like they're on an adventure. And we're people who go into the uncharted territories and there's people who need to go get that fast pass and that's cool, you know? That's fine. I'm good with it. There's no judgment. I don't have zero judgment towards it. I just don't enjoy it. And I don't judge them, so don't judge me. Um, and don't don't judge us, but I I, I I am so freaked out by this conversation right now. <laughs> we were, <laughs> we're planning on well, having it. I just think it's funny when someone says, I, I just need some good food. That can mean something completely different. Someone might be saying, I need to, I just need to get a good meal. They they mean they need to go get fast food. They just need a good burger and fries and a milkshake. Other person, I need to get good food. They mean they need to go get fish and you know, salad and it's like the perfectly healthy thing. And some people say they need to get good food. They're going to get some Michelin star restaurant where they're still hungry when it's over and they don't know what they've eaten. And so when a person says, I need to get good food, a good meal, they can mean completely different things. And I think that's also true in like the faith experience when someone says, oh, I, I you know, I, I need some, I need a place that goes deep. Like, and oftentimes I mean, I want to go to a place that goes deep in terms of, um, the theological conversation about the Bible, but I don't want to go too deep about my life and because I don't true. want you to mess with my life. It's true. And another person goes, I want to go deep. What they mean is I want to feel something emotionally at the deepest level, but I don't want you to challenge my bad thinking. And, and, and so really the question becomes, what's deep to you? And, um, and, and I think that, you know, a part of my own like journey here has been, Life has to make sense to me. I I just can't. I I I just don't do well when we live in cliches, or when we live at a superficial level. And I, I have to. Life has to make sense to me. So when I'm reading the Bible, you know, I have to grapple with the truth of it. When I'm living life itself, I grapple with: Does this really work or not? And and I'm you know, and so I think I think the the most, for me, the most powerful place to be is where you're just struggling with what's real and you're willing to fight through that and figure that out and step into that and then live that. That for me is what's super exciting about being alive. It goes back to our opening conversation. What's your morning routine? Routine, like? Because really oh, what you're doing like is you're far, trying to- Far, far, we've gone far away from that. Yeah, but it's like, it really is. It's like what prepares you for life? You know, how do you live life fully? And, um, and you know, you're, you have, you have a better ability to help a person. Like when someone's a brand new Christian, I'll go, Hey, Aaron, we'll really help you get, get started. Like you're very good at teaching people steps. Yeah. Better than you, but not in a bad, not in a bad way. You, you just think non linearly in that way. Yeah. You know, you know, and but, 
these are all steps you helped me find. Yeah. 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 No, I know. And, but it was like, um, it was challenging, you know, for you. Yeah, it was, it was challenging. And, you know, because I go like one of the most important things I do in my day is I open my mind to new possibilities. Like that's a hard thing to transfer. You know, that I, I create like a, an openness inside of me for new thoughts, new ideas, new perspectives, new ways of seeing reality. And that for me is a discipline. It doesn't look like a discipline. It, you know, it, it's not it, it's not as concrete as a washboard stomach or doing Why do a sit-up. you always use washboard stomach? Let's use another one. A concrete is what? It's doing sit-ups. It's not as concrete as writing a journal every day. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not as concrete as... Most of the actions people tell you to take to expand yourself. Hmm. But for me, the most expansive things are um, pushing the boundaries of my imagination. Hmm. How do you do that? Um, not, not trying to make you do steps, but how do you specifically do it? Or do you, is it something you do or is it something you, you just, you, is it something you do knowingly or something that you just do naturally? I, well, I think that I, it's both. Okay. I think it's both. I, I think that I look back and um, science fiction novels expanded my imagination and, and, and actually made me realize that, that there are ways of seeing reality or thinking about reality that I had not yet considered that the possibilities were endless. And, and I think then chess helped me think strategically and so I, I look back and I go, the two things that I got early on was chess and mythology. And the chess made me strategic, the mythology made me imaginative. And, and, and I would add that the, the, the combination of them gave me a heroic narrative. Because you know, in chess, it's, it's, it's a battle. It's two kingdoms, two empires at war with each other. And your job is both to protect the queen and to conquer the other army or protect the king and to conquer the other army. And, and by the way, chess is a very non-chauvinistic game because the most powerful piece on the board is the queen. The most vulnerable one is the king. <laughs> yeah, he, he can't do nothing. No. And uh, all, his only job is to stay alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then what mythology did for me, one is it, it, it opened my imagination to endless possibilities, but also gave me heroic narrative. And, and so it's almost like the, these three things converged, a strategic mind, an imaginative mind, and a heroic soul, where um, every myth is about essentially a hero or an anti-hero. And, you know, and in a sense, chess is a heroic game. I was raised to believe it was a heroic game. And your pieces have to take risks. Your pieces are in danger of being eaten. <laughs> you know, they, and you have to take, uh, live in the tension of um, the potential failure for potential success. Okay, so tell me, how yeah. do you wander? How do you, how do you become more imaginative? I think one of the ways that you wander is you question all your assumptions. You, you know, so the things you, that- Give me an example of an assumption that you question. You, you know, I, I tell you, I found notes from years and years back where um, I, I wrote down a chapter of a book about when men could fly and breathe underwater. Yeah. And, you know, and so I look, I go all the way back and I go in, in Genesis, we assume Adam and Eve couldn't fly and couldn't breathe underwater. We put all of our constraints on them. And, and a part of the way I would look at things and go, what, is there any principle or any, any truth in the Bible that tells me Adam and Eve had those limitations? And I go, no, there's not. Those are self-imposed by our limitations. So I always, I, I just, that's where I begin to challenge assumptions that have been given me, you know, and- um, I have a question then, Let's talk, what about hell? We, we said we were gonna say this for an oh, episode, but maybe we do a little few minutes on this. But, okay. I know what we're gonna say. That, then the, then the other question is, is it possible that Adam and Eve civilized or colonized the earth, built the pyramids, led a civilization that was pre-flood, had an advanced human society that was wiped out by a massive environmental catastrophe 
that we know from the Bible as the flood and that only Noah and them survived. How do you build this tech? How, how do you move the massive pieces in Egypt when even in today's technology, those pieces would be almost impossible to move? Like, how do we explain that there are parallel civilizations in Central America as they're in Egypt? And, and, you know, how do you explain that these civilizations were so advanced and so primitive at the same time? And that the moment those advancements came to existence, it seems as if those civilizations fell back a thousand years. And, and so I, I, so my imagination goes, defy, uh, uh, don't accept your assumptions that the human story is exactly the way that we've projected it. So I think a lot of the reasons I can see the Bible so differently is that I'm always attacking my own assumptions and the assumptions of, of others and, uh, in that. And, um, and I think that actually expands my imagination. The other thing I do is I listen to people who disagree with me. And um, that's something people have a really hard time doing. Yeah. A lot of the material for my talks on Sundays are by listening to people who do not believe in God and have massive influence in society and are approaching an issue that I think is really important. And I think they have the best argument out there. And I go, I need to create a, a, like a, a narrative of faith that actually deconstructs this idea, but puts it in the context of faith and the scriptures. And people don't even know I'm doing it. And um, they, they, they don't oftentimes even realize that I'm trying to establish a platform for faith to actually be able to have this debate 10 years from now or 50 years from now that I, I kind of project is going to happen one day. I love it. You know, okay, hold on. I think we're, we've hit our, yeah. And you asked about hell, but that has to wait no, for we'll, another podcast. I'll have to get it at a different time. Okay. We've been going <laughs> for 55 minutes. I think we're good. We're good. All right, man. Thank you so much for this, this episode. I too, I'm honestly, guys, I'm, I'm in, I'm a little culture shocked right now. I don't, I don't know if I'm traumatized or triggered or gaslit or manipulated. I don't know what it is. Nothing. You know, I'm just, i I was not expecting that bumpy terrain. I know. And then it's funny because whenever we go into like more like deeply I know. Christian spaces, we usually get a lot of hate. Yeah. We'll get some wizards <laughs> commenting, but it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. Um, but it's good. It's a good conversation. The thing, the, the great part of, I think, maybe where I'm at in life is that there's nothing any of those guys can give me that I want. Right. There's nothing they can take away from me either. Like, you can come for me. You can come for my character. You can come for my, the things I've done wrong in the past. I haven't done anything that wrong. I'm pretty good. I've, you know, made some mistakes. Probably dated some of the wrong people. I've been mean at times. I'm working on it. Um, but I would say this. It was you who said all the bad things, though. All I said is I don't, I don't mess with Bethel. <laughs> Honestly, um, I have, I'm so restrained. You are so restrained. There's so much more I want to say. Yes. And I think it, it probably needs to be said. At some point. At some point. We might, maybe we do the, maybe we do the, the, the bunker, we'll do the bunker talks, like the X-Files, like all the conversations that can't get released until, you know, both of us pass away. <laughs> Yeah, in a hundred yeah. years, well, like I mean, the Wu Tang unreleased record. They yeah. can't release it for eighty-eight years. Yeah, it, it, there's just. <laughs> there's Did you just, hear about that? No. You know the guy who is the guy? Is it Sri or that that the the guy who got destroyed in the media for getting buying the rights for the HIV drug? I think, and then charging like a hundred x for for like what it what it cost to make, and they ended up being in prison for a few years. Well, that guy's out. The internet is undefeated because now that guy's on podcasts <laughs> and so he's getting he's getting like destroyed on some pod and they're like well you know he he had bought the wu-tang unreleased record for two million dollars and they turned it into an nft i think but i think they only released one c they only gave they gave him the only copy of that cd and then he owns the rights i guess to that record so but he can't release it for 88 years Wow. So that's part of the contract. So he's like, no, no, no. Everyone's hating me for the Wu Tang record because, because then he was doing, he did the the drug thing, and he was like, what's his name? Did you find him? Martin Martin Shrelly. No, it's fine. It's fine. Hey, you get it. Um, but it, but everyone's you know mad about him for the for the extortion of that drug, which that's pharmaceutical is such a crazy industry in and of itself. It's so unethical. 
But then he bought the Wu Tang record, and I was like, everyone's mad that he wouldn't release it. And he's like, no, in the contract, I couldn't release it. Wow. And I still don't think he's a wonderful guy, but I had as a kind of crazy idea, right? Maybe we re- maybe we record a couple mind shifts that won't release for another fifty years. Yeah, I won't be around. Yeah, there's there's so many things. Even in this whole personal development business world, I I'm going, wow, there are tremendous parallels to the reasons I actually left a lot of the public speaking spaces in the Christian world. I mean, the the same level of of corruption with televangelists that I've always thought were just incredibly yeah um, yeah evil yeah evil dirty grimy whatever you yeah call it just it. doesn't you don't even want to associate it now i'm seeing it in another space and in fact i told you i took a photograph of it this really famous motivational speaker who's grant also cardone. a famous preacher what oh my bad <laughs> what are you gonna say <laughs> grant cardone <laughs> no no we like to him after us, but um he posts a post i am the best speaker in the world and you know i'm not the best speaker in the world just because i'm the best speaker in the world but because i trust god and that's why i'm the best speaker in the world that's and i'm so wild man and like i, I took a photograph and i thought this is the intersection of spirituality and narcissism you know one what in the world makes you think you're the best in the world <laughs> And if you were the best in the world, you wouldn't have to tell everyone you're the best in the world. Yeah. It would just be so obvious. Yeah. And um, yeah. and 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 if you're the best in the world and it's because of Jesus, then you probably would be unbelievably humble. And your humility would allow other people to say it about you rather than you saying it about yourself. And I just look at things like this and I think it's just such a bizarre world where we just accept things as healthy. You know, yeah, it's interesting because I remember during COVID, a lot of people when all this stuff went down with Hillsong, and I feel comfortable saying that because, you know, we haven't really touched on it much. Um, and people who know, know what that is and what that went through. But it affects everyone who believes to some degree because, you know, you meet people out and, and you meet people. Who, I remember I was at a wedding in Greece and everyone's hanging out this big after party dinner time. And this, the, the bride came up to me and was like, so how do you guys launder money at Mosaic? And I was like, what? I was like, girl, I was like, please, I'll walk you into the accountant's office. You will see there ain't nothing. There ain't no money anywhere. I wish we had money. I know. I, I would be, we will, you think we would let it le- like be like this? <laughs> that we'd have 20 staff? Like, you know, just little things. And, and, and she's like, well, and I was like, where, can I ask you where, it can, where this is coming from? And she was like, well, I watched this documentary on Hulu and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, I was like, my, I was like, um, no, but I would say this. Oh, but no, because our, reputa- it does affect the reputation because people saying we're money laundering. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does affect our reputation, right? And people who engage on any type of corruption in that way, it affects people, right? And so it's like, but, but, you know, it is contextual because people in our world, we have different, we're, we live by a different set of rules, right? And then you go into like my my friends who are Jewish, like they charge for temple. I had no idea. I didn't I'm know sure that either. free temple, but not free temple at, at the one at Wilshire Corridor. It's like $250 a seat. Wow. And then I guess to sit in the front, it's like 2,500. That's like a U2 concert. My man, we need to change the structure of the way we do. No, but it, it, you know, and I, and I like the way, I like what we do. I like that it's open source. I like that people can access it. I like that that's part of our core value, right? But the reality is that, you know, culturally things are different. And so to grow up in it, I feel more confident now being in it going, you know, I'm not that, I am this. And I feel comfortable enough to defend myself and to, and to be open. But you see these business guys sometimes now. And I'm like, man, you you smell it out the same way we smell it out in church. Being like, nah, I don't know if this feels right. You know, and we, we've gone to events that that I, you know, I've asked you like, please, can we never come back here? Like, we don't need this. Yeah. Like, this isn't for us. And you, you don't know until you go for a yeah. lot of these people because you do your best. You see them on Instagram or see them, their podcasts and you think they're great. And then you just realize this, the culture doesn't fit you. The tough thing with us is that I don't feel that we fit a lot of cultures. And so, which I am trying to be open on that other side. And oh, this is what I was talking about. A lot of young guys would come to me when that whole Hillsong documentary stuff was going on and hit me up on IG or hit me up. It was during COVID. I didn't have, you know, we were working, but at night it was just chilling by myself yeah. up the hill. And one of one of my buddies from Australia hit me up and he's a, he was a youth pastor. And I think now he's a campus pastor or something. And, you know, he was so distraught about, you know, the Judah's connection to Carl and all these people. And I was like, look, man, I, I, Judah to me, he's super kind. And I think he's a straight up dude, a care, high character guy. But people have bad friends sometimes. I'm not saying Carl, Carl was going through a hard moment, whatever. I'm not trying to get into that. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I just said, I was like, look, man, 
from the get, you can know something's funny about a culture, right? And and about things. And I was like, but you're putting way too much of your reliance on people. Yeah. You know, like yeah. all that stuff happened. I hope Carl has the best life ever. I hope I, I don't wish bad on anyone, you know, um, other than Diet Pepsi. I wish bad on Diet Pepsi. I hate that thing. That, <laughs> Diet Pepsi trash water. That's disgusting. Um, uh, and but but other than that, I'm like you 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 have your value systems aligned misaligned. And that for me really was like an eye-opening season of life going like, no, no, my faith can struggle. My 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 life can go through ups and downs, but it isn't going to change what I believe. It might change how I relate to it and I have to adjust how I relate to it. But for the most part, I think having these conversations are so important for people because it disconnects, it disconnects them. Um, I think we worship the wrong things at times and that's something we can talk about another time. I think the reality, these are good conversations to have. Yeah. I, I think the reason people sometimes get very disillusioned is we're drawn to people who are actually like us. And then when they crash and burn, it has a more visceral effect. Yeah, because it's watching yourself crash and burn. Yeah. And then, you know, yeah. I, I talked to him a few years later and he's like, you know, man, he's like reposting all the clips from all those guys. And I was like, did you not learn? And he was like, no, I just decided like, it isn't my problem. And in, and I and I felt uncomfortable about it because like maybe he's just able to forgive faster than I am or accept it faster than I am. But I think a bit of it is like when when uh, when people are when people's eyes are open to the facade, they would they would rather they take the blue pill. They would rather the facade just be there again because it makes them feel safe. So they just ignore the stuff they choose to ignore versus just seeing it all and go, you know what? Like I can accept brokenness, but I'm I, but it doesn't mean I'm buying into it. Yeah, I think probably the most surprising thing even is I've spent more time in this uh, in the business world and in the personal development space is that, <laughs> strangely, this is a positive thing. <clears throat> I, I always struggle with sense of disillusionment because you could see through the facade in the Christian world. Yes. And and if you're in there too much and only you think the facade's only there, the, fa the facade is completely there in the business world. It's completely there in the personal development For space. Sure. And I realized, oh, okay, this isn't a Christian problem. This is a human problem. <laughs> this isn't a Christian issue. This is no. a human issue. Yes, it is. And it just happens that some people believe in God and some people don't, or some people um, are in the church world, some people in the business world. It's the same difference. It is. It really is. And, you know, and, and, and so, you know, whatever world you choose to be in, you just have to be discerning, and um, if you want six, the success they have, you'll overlook the things that are obvious that you should pay attention to. And you want to make sure that you don't want to just get what a person has. You want to become more like a person is. Find people who are the kind of person you want to become. And they're the people you should follow. They're the people you should allow to be your mentors and your influences in their life. Don't accept any structure or system that promises you success at the cost of the person you become. The system needs to affect who you become, not just what you accomplish, because it will. And so just look at who's created the system, go, I would like to become like that person, then I think you're in a better space. And I think I, yeah, I'm going to bring this back to our business and I'm going to sell a little bit, but like, I think that's what makes the arena community really different. Yeah. Cause that like, you don't promise. We talk about find your voice, master your message, but you don't promise you're going to be the greatest speaker of all time. No. You're like, Hey, this is an essence thing. This is attrition. Like you need to have time to soak this in, to let your inside start to change and evolve and grow for it to bleed on the outside and so it becomes natural for you. And you are really, it's funny because you're not like a step-by-step -step guy, but you really are like a marinade, but also with a lot of action. You know, you're like, you need to soak this in. You need to absorb. You need to open your eyes. I was, I've been walking through, and I know we said we're going to finish, but we're still talking. But I, you, we've been talking about like what it, I've been trying to like, what would I write down if I were to write something about creative direction and that walk other people through it? And at first, it, you know, you said I'm, uh, I, I'm more sensitive to, to anything sensatory, right? <laughs> and I, I started, that was my first thing I wrote down was open your eyes or shut them. <laughs> <laughs> right you have these switches right like you choose to taste something or you choose not to taste something and so it is it is like go and taste new things go and see new things go and listen to new things go experience 
the lack of tasting or seeing or you know i think there's so much to be found in the removal of of sense uh, sensatory moments right um and so like i have a real big sensitivity to sound i don't like being in places that feel chaotic no i don't like nba games i don't because they I, it brings like a chaos to me i don't i like football games it's weird the chaos level goes to 1000 versus 100 and i i feel safe now you know so <laughs> it, it is like but it's this act of 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 knowing engaging of like what you need and what you don't need it's like really really important i think um that's all i got now let's wrap this thing up yeah no, but in the arena <laughs> the arena join us in the community we're doing these monthly summits the last week of every month with different speakers different communicators our conferences in october 10th 11th, 12th, we're going to drop in the registration link below uh, in this episode. So join us this, this year. This is our first time we're really talking about it. So No, that'd be great. Yeah. I, and just remember, everything we do, we're not just going to focus on what you accomplish. We're going to focus on who you become. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Thanks right. for doing this. It's a great conversation.